Will you stand with me as we look at God's word again? I'm reading from the 13th chapter of Luke. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worth sinners, worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? So I tell you, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the towers of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Father, we cannot say that you have not warned us. You cannot cannot say that as we read Scripture and as we come to it, that there is not sufficient evidence and sufficient message, sufficient grace to cover every sin. But Father, why do we, why do we resist? And um, Lord, as, as we come to you this morning, um, thinking of the sin that so easily attaches itself to us, even as believers, pray that you will reach our hearts in a way that None of us could ever do, but your Holy Spirit can through your word, and we pray for that. Lord, we're burdened this morning for many needs. We pray for those who are physically disabled or in need. Uh, Thank you for the many answers to prayer we've seen in recent days along those lines, but still many suffering from uh, illness or from uh, operations or surgeries, various things. Would you please undertake um, and, uh, Lord, help help things to go well, help people to heal quickly, be on their feet. But Lord, we pray far more for our spiritual health. We all need you. We need you to revive our hearts. We need you to turn our attentions toward you on a daily basis, not just on Sunday. And so we pray for that. Pray for all the kids that went upstairs. I wasn't sure there'd be anybody left this morning here. And so I thank you for those children, and I pray that Lord, as they are going through an exercise today, that you will just use this as one more way that they understand that you love them in a very special way. And that over time, you will call them to yourself. That you will become very, very real to them. And that what you've done for all of us will become very real to them. Thank you, Father, for yourself. Bless this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, turn with me, if you haven't already, to Luke 13. Will Rogers once gave a uh, clock to a friend that had an engraving on it. It said this, said the clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time we own. Love life, toil with a will. Do not wait until tomorrow, for the clock may then be still. You say, well, that sounds a little morose, But it's not. That, beloved, is the daily reality that we have a tendency to ignore or to deny. And the fact is, not only will time run out one day, but the worst problem is that outside of Christ, of course, we're under a spiritual death sentence. We need to know that. And we need to be prepared and do something about that. And Disasters are one way that the Lord graciously reminds us of this truth and calls us to do something about it. This passage has two tragedies that are mentioned, one imposed and one natural. But Jesus finds the same warning in both of them, interestingly enough, as he tries to help us learn how to look at tragedy You remember at the end of Luke 12, Jesus had warned this same group of people, you guys don't know how to read the signs. 
of the times. You're not understanding who I am. But let me warn you, you need, you need to be sure that as you're headed toward your end, as you're headed toward your engagement with God, you need to make sure that you've settled out of court. You need to make sure that you have settled with God before you find yourself standing face to face before him because then it's too late. So he urged them to settle out of court for their spiritual natures. But this chapter takes up right immediately after that. There were some present at that very time. These are the ones who are denying what he's just said and they're saying, what do you mean signs? You got this all wrong. We know signs. Let us show you how, you how we know signs. We know that those Galileans that Pilate killed a few days ago, we know that they must have done something pretty bad. We can tell signs. We know judgment when we see it. And in that comment, in those comments, they had made two devastatingly bad moralistic assumptions that Jesus attacks in this passage. If you were with us last week, we examined those. The first assumption they made was that people always get what they deserve, which is, in fact, sometimes true, but many times not. On either side of that equation, get what you deserve bad, get what you deserve good. They assumed something that wasn't true. They assumed another thing. They assumed that good people don't need to settle. Good people, namely them, that's who they're thinking of, don't need to settle. They were good enough. That was their opinion. And so we said, let's look at this passage under the outline, the two great tragedies, which we've examined, and the two grave traps, which we looked at last week, bad ways of, of, of interpreting these tragedies. So how should we interpret them? That brings us to today when we want to look at two gospel truths, two gospel truths that come out of this passage. This is, what we have here is the core of what Jesus was teaching all the way through his teaching and preaching ministry. It always came back to exactly what we have here, two gospel truths. Now notice, first of all, the similarity of Jesus' response to each tragedy. Same, basically the same exact wording. In verse 2, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Obviously, that is what they were thinking, but that's what Jesus is taking issue with. Verse 4, or those 18 on, the, on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Again, the answer was yes, they did think that. They thought that's exactly the case. Their whole theological system was moralistic. They believed, they believed that every hardship, every adversity, every defeat, every disability, every disaster, they believed was a direct result of sin in that person's life. They saw a direct link between what happened to people and their life, their moral life. That is exactly what they believed. And of course, it left them feeling pretty good at this point in time because after all, they hadn't been slaughtered and they didn't have towers falling on them. But as we saw last week, Jesus saw that that was flawed thinking. And so we really, we kind of went through scripture to see some of the reasons why that was flawed thinking. But on this occasion, Jesus, interestingly enough, doesn't really go there. He doesn't argue the point. Instead, Jesus goes straight to a presentation of the gospel with emphasis here on the negative side because that's the piece they were missing. So he says in verse 3, Now I tell you, unless you repent, you shall also likewise perish. And for emphasis in verse 5, I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. It must be be important. He said it twice. I think he said it with love and he said it with emphasis. It implies, beloved, two critical truths that these people were not getting. Two critical truths that they were not getting, but that we must get if we ever hope to see heaven. 
The two truths, what are they? Number one, we are all living on borrowed time. We are all living on borrowed time. Again, in verse 2 and in verse 4, Jesus asked the same telling question. Do you think that these who suffered the tragedy were worse than anybody else? Do you think that? And they would have answered yes. But you see, in even asking these questions, Jesus is implying that's the wrong answer. That is not the right answer. He's aiming straight at the heart of their religious system. See, they saw humanity as divided into two parts. Those who are good and those who are bad. Those who were keeping the law of God and those who were not. It was a tidy little moralistic system and it left them feeling very good because they were able to just look down on anybody who they considered less righteous than themselves, prop themselves up with the thought that they were better than their neighbor and so therefore they would be okay with God. Does it sound familiar? Most of our neighbors think this same thing. Perhaps some of us here today think that same thing. But Jesus comes right out and says, no, not once, but twice. No, no, no. That's the wrong assumption. When you see people suffer, that is not necessarily immediate retribution for sin. And then he turns right around and says, but repent lest you perish too. It's that last phrase that's really telling. See, if Jesus had just said, well, no, that's not the issue. God doesn't treat people like that. It's not punishment for sin. We'd have to say, well, wait a minute then. So life isn't fair. Life does stink. Life is difficult. If they don't deserve it, then what's going on? But you see, he doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't say that they didn't deserve it. We can't, we can't read that into his no answer. He doesn't say they didn't deserve it. He doesn't say that they were no worse than, he just says that they were no worse than anybody else. He says, this happened to them, but that doesn't mean that they were worse than you. He just says it wasn't the direct result of some specific sin, but he doesn't say they didn't deserve it. In fact, he turns right around and lays a haymaker on the audience by saying, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. <laughs> Do you realize with, the, with these words, Jesus is just throwing everybody under the same bus. Why? Because we all deserve to be under the bus. We all deserve to have the tragedy fall on us. We all deserve that. On the one hand, don't think these people are, are worse than you are, Jesus is saying. But on the other hand, realize that every person on earth deserves to be under the tower. Don't feel smug. You deserve a fate no better than them. You deserve to have the tower fall on you too. If God did what you deserve, you'd be under the tower too. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? Sounds really challenging. And it is. It's not calculated to win friends and influence people, beloved. It's calculated to bring reality into their life and into our life. Because we ignore certain realities. It's calculated to bring all of us face to face with our own condemnation. You see, this audience, like, like so many people, have never considered that they might be bad. They were Jews, God's chosen people. They were the Jews who went to synagogue every Sabbath day. Almost said Sunday there. That wouldn't have been good, would it? Every Sabbath day. They wouldn't have they wouldn't have messed up the Sabbath for their life. They were the Jews who were giving money. They were the Jews who were giving alms to people. But they had one fatal flaw. They had one fatal flaw. This is the fatal flaw that we find throughout the Bible. Their hearts were far from God. Outwardly, they looked really good. But their hearts were far from God. They were trusting in what they did instead of trusting in a God who wanted to change their heart. Somehow they thought they could impress God with what they did outwardly when their heart was evil. And yet God says, I don't look on outward appearances. I look on the heart. That's the problem. That's the fatal 
flaw. And Jesus is trying to startle them into a true look at who they really are, at how God sees them. He's urging them to realize that even now, they're living on the basis of God's mercy, but judgment is coming. They're living on borrowed time. Jesus is saying, you, likewise, just like he would say to us. Jesus is saying, don't look on your works, look on your heart. Think of all the lies that you've told and continue to tell and get away with it. Think of all the stupid choices that you've made, and maybe you've paid for some of them, but otherwise you're still going pretty good in spite of them. Think of all the times you've betrayed a friend. Think of all the times that you've covet what somebody else has and even now have that in your heart. Think of the bitterness that you're harboring in your heart. Think of the revenge that's there because somebody has betrayed you and you are anxious to get back at them or at least that hatred is in your heart. Think of the way you lose your temper and let it get away from you and hurt those that you love most. Think of all of those things and think of the way that you constantly live for self instead of living for God. See yourself as for who you really are inside. If you have, have ever received adequate consequences for the stupid, wrong, proud, selfish things that we've done, God is graciously, again and again and again, day in and day out, protecting us, not giving us what we deserve. But how do we treat that? Our hearts are filled with Denial and excuses, right? And, 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 and we don't see them as God sees them. Filled with pride, alienation, hatred, according to the way Jesus interprets it, murder is in our heart. Lust, lasciviousness, idolatry, adultery, it's all there. And it's only when we begin to realize that that's who we are that we'll realize borrowed time. I'm on borrowed time. God is looking for the broken and contrite heart that John read about this morning and we give him pride, defensiveness, arrogance, self-justification. Jesus is saying you, likewise. If you got what you deserved, you likewise. Here's the truth, beloved. The gospel is Here's the truth of the gospel. We are way more flawed than we could ever imagine. But we are way more loved than we could ever dream. Both of those are two sides to the gospel. But until we acknowledge the one, we can't benefit from the other. Do you see that? Until we agree with God about who we are. That's what confession means. It means to agree with God about what he sees in us. We can't really enjoy the love that he wants to impart to us. We can't appreciate the sacrifice that he's made on our heart. Instead, we take God's patience and abuse it by saying, well, the reason I'm okay and the reason I'm not being hit by tragedy at the moment is because I am self-righteous. It's because I do things right. That's why good fortune is mine. And God is saying constantly, oh, no, it's not. It's my mercy. You live on borrowed time? We're all equally deserving of God's judgment, Right? Romans 3.23 that we've memorized all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. James says in James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Did you ever wonder how could God say something like that? I mean, in essence, that verse would mean an evil thought of some kind, you know, a thought of revenge or a simple swear word is just as bad as somebody committing murder, right? How could God say that? Well, there's, there's really a couple of answers to that question, at least. The first would be God can say that because sin is not just a violation of a list of do's and don'ts. That would be one thing. It's not what it is. That's what human law is. 
It's a violation of a list of do's and don'ts, right? We kind of equate that with the law of God. It's not the same. A, vi- a sin is a violation not of a list of do's and don'ts. It's a violation of God's character. It's a violation of God himself. That's why one sin is as bad as another because every one of them is a, is a gross misrepresentation of who God is, which is the reason we were created in the first place, to bring glory to him by the way we live. And every sin is a denial of that. So breaking even one point is a violation of his whole character, not just part of it. But here's the second reason God can say that is because every single day we all violate all the commandments in our heart every day, right? Now you can tell me you're better than that. Good luck. I'll be glad to follow you around and we'll talk about your heart. <clears throat> we have murder in our heart every day. We have lust in our heart every day. Listen, I know the lust issue is there because I know television. I know the media. I know the, we're all attacked by the same thing, right? Greed is there in our heart. The desire to have what others have. The desire to be who somebody else is. Ambition plagues us. Selfishness is at the core of our being. An inability to control ourselves. We're living on borrowed time, but we're in denial. We're in denial. If you died tonight, if you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? That's a really good question, right? It's a question that comes from some of the great evangelists that we've seen in our time, Billy Graham. Probably that question was made more famous than anyone by James Kennedy. Another Kennedy. Uh, Different James Kennedy. If you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? But we're in denial, beloved. A recent survey by Lifeway Research showed this. It said 30% of the people say they do wonder about that question once in a while. 11% said, yeah, I wonder about that once a year maybe. More than 50% of the people said, never crosses my mind. Our culture has attuned us to a denial of who we are before God. It doesn't even cross our mind. Listen to what a medieval and Reformation theologian says about the time of Martin Luther. It says, in the time of Martin Luther, 1500s, almost every single human being in European civilization woke up afraid that he would die before nightfall. Eternal destiny was a daily, hourly, minute-by-minute thought. Every night, as the late medieval and early Reformation human being closed his eyes, he feared that he would wake up in either heaven or hell. You, he said to his audience, do not live with that fear. How right he was. Now listen, beloved, God doesn't want us to live in fear. That's not the point. But we can't legitimately escape fear until we face up to it, acknowledge that we can't fix it, and accept the gift that God offers that can fix it. Right? But we deny that we're living on borrowed time. So what's the solution? Well, the second piece of this is what? Our only hope is repentance. Our only hope is repentance. So we're on borrowed time. What do we do? Jesus gives a one-word answer. Repent. What does it mean to repent? We've gone through this many times, but let's go through it again. What does it mean to repent? Repent means you're on your way headed towards Cheyenne. And then because of something, something causes you to turn around and go completely the opposite direction, right back toward Denver, right? That's repentance. Repentance is in your life. It's to change your life direction. Repentance is to be headed one way and to turn around completely and go the other way. 
Repentance is twofold. It's to turn away from sin and self and toward God. You have to be careful because you can turn slightly. You can turn from one idol to another. That's very possible. Sometimes we turn from a bad idol to a good idol. Doesn't matter if it's still an idol. Good things can be idols if they are preeminent, right? Repentance is to turn from all idols to God. Can you say that you really have done that? Can you say that that's part of who you are? Because that's what Jesus is asking for here. That's repentance. Now, keep in mind, when Jesus says you must repent or you will likewise perish, he's not talking to the down and outers here. He's not talking to people that were morally corrupt. He's not talking to the skid row people of his day. He's saying this to people who are living a pretty good life right about now. They've got enough time to be out and follow this rabbi around the country. They want to see the miracles. They have the whatever, the freedom and the money and whatever else it takes to go out and follow him. And we already know they're thinking that themselves that they're doing pretty good. These people are doing okay. This is his counsel. This is Jesus' counsel to those who are trouble-free at the moment. There's no towers falling on them. They are righteous. They're the most righteous people on the planet. Attending church, giving their money, doing the things, following all the rules. And Jesus is saying that when things are really smooth and when you're most self-satisfied, that's when you most need to look at your heart. Find out who you really are because it's pretty easy to sail right on through and Jesus is saying, watch out, you're going to perish, look out. That happened to those people so that you could look at it and say, okay, I'm deserving too. What do I need to do? It's a very important truth here. Re re repentance is not primarily about breaking the rules. Of course, it is that. And if you go out and rob a bank, if you lie, if you cheat, if you're unfaithful, if you are angry at your spouse or your children, you need to confess the sin and abandon it, right? Confession, repentance is a matter of breaking the rules, but that's not the essence of repentance because that's not the essence of sin. The essence of sin is, as we've said, violating the character of God. The essence of sin is violating God repla by replacing him with self. I'm trying to think of ways to say this so that it gets across to us. The essence of sin is putting yourself or something you desire in the place that only God should have. The essence of sin, here's another way to think of it, is being your own savior. The essence of sin is saying, this is the thing that's most important to me. And it's not just what you say, beloved. It's, you have to look at your life to determine this. And how do, you, how do you determine what's most important to you? How do you determine what it is you worship? How do you determine what your Savior is? By looking at your life. By looking into your heart and then seeing what does it result in. And is it God or is it something else? It could be something that's very good, except it's taken God's place. And Jesus is saying it's, in the, it's when we're in these trouble-free times that we most need to be alert to this possibility. Society convinces us that sin is irrelevant or maybe even non-existent, right? It's what society will tell you. Naturalism tells us that what we call sin is just the residue of an evolutionary process that rewards aggressive behavior and we're not responsible. It's just who we are. Psychology tells us that what we call sin is just an overactive conscience. What you need to do is get to a psychiatrist and get them to convince you to ignore the guilt. And then you'll be okay. Liberal theology tells us that sin is simply a low self-esteem. And the solution is to find and heal your inner self somehow. Moralism tells us that sin is a list of do's and don'ts, but that's all it is. You just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Notice that not a single one of those says anything about God. And see, the Bible is insistent. No, that's not what sin is. The 
essence of sin, the essential character of sin, is replacing God with self. It doesn't matter whether it was the first sin so long ago that came in the life of this great being that God had created, Lucifer, who said in Isaiah 14, 14, I will ascend the heights of the clouds and I will make myself like the Most High. Replace God with self. Doesn't matter whether it's Lucifer, or whether it's Adam and Eve falling for the line, for when you eat it, the day the, your, the, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Or whether it's the people at the Tower of Babel saying, let us, make a name for ourselves. Sin is replacing God with self. That's why Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. That's the first thing he said, right? Take up his cross daily and follow me. It's a drastic operation, beloved, to come to faith in Christ. Replacing God with self. So Jesus says, don't think you're better than those that Pilate killed or that were crushed by the tower. Don't think your goodness is saving you. The only reason you have not been crushed is because of God's grace. He's giving you more time. But if you use it to self-justify or if you use it to ignore him altogether and count on yourself justification, your self-righteousness to save you, you will also likewise perish. Listen, there's a, there's a telling verse in Romans 2, 4. Romans 2, 4. It explains why God gives us more time. Let me just read it for you. It says this. It says, or do you presume? Do you presume on the riches of God's kindness? and his forbearance, and his patience. Do you see what Paul's saying? He's saying, listen, God is patient. He is kind. He is forbearing. The very fact that you're alive is testament to that fact. But he says, do you presume on that, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? He's given you life for one more day so that you have the opportunity to repent. And instead, we use that day to say, thanks anyway, but I'm good enough. Towers are not falling on me. You know, we should ask an important question here, which is why could Jesus say what you need to do is repent? Seems like that's a pretty simple thing in a way. How can that possibly be enough? If I have sinned and sin has to be paid for, how can Jesus say just repent? The thing that drives me is I think I need to pay for my sin. And Jesus is saying, yes, you're right. Your sin does need to be paid for. But the reason I can tell you just repent is because of this. Jesus, even at the moment that he said that to these people, was on his way to Jerusalem where he was going to have the ultimate tower fall on him so that it need not fall on any of us. That's why. The tower of the judgment of God against sin, he was going to willingly accept. He was going to accept being crushed by the tower of God's justice and of God's judgment that must eventually fall on all sin. Jesus was going to allow that to happen. He's going to let it fall on him so that it doesn't have to fall on me. It doesn't have to fall on you. But see, here's the thing. If you refuse his gift, if you choose to stay the course and do it your own way, then eventually the tower must fall on you. But Jesus could offer forgiveness because he was on his way to pay for it. It's his payment that makes our redemption and our release and our deliverance possible. To repent is to acknowledge that all of our good works are wonderful if they're an expression of a broken and repentant heart, but they are absolutely useless if, they, if we see them as a means to somehow obligate God. They'll never be enough. 
Turn with me to Philippians. I just want you to see this. We've talked about this passage before, but it's so striking. You see, in the, in the end, in some ways, it's not even our sin that condemns us. It's our goodness that condemns us. Because we think our goodness is good enough, and it never is. And it was only when Paul came to that recognition that salvation finally entered his life. Look what he says in Philippians 3. Let's start in verse, so verse 4. Kind of the middle of the verse. He says, if anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh. In other words, if you think you can make it on your own, if you think you're good enough, if anyone else thinks he has reason to have confidence in the flesh, I have more. I can outdo you. I was circumcised on the eighth day, just as the law required. I was of the people of Israel. I was one of the chosen people. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. The first king of Israel came from my tribe. I'm, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. In other words, I paid close attention to it. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church, which I saw as being against the law of God. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul could honestly say outwardly, I'm blameless. I suspect few of us could say that. Outwardly blameless. But look what he says in verse 7. Whatever gain I had, whatever, in other words, whatever things I had on the plus side of the ledger. Those of you who know anything about accounting, you have the debit side and you have the plus side, right? And he said, whatever was on the plus side of the ledger, which was a lot, I counted as loss. Why, Paul? For the sake of knowing Christ. It was the only way I could come to Christ. I couldn't come to Christ and say, here's my good stuff. Accept me. It didn't work. I had, to, I had to move all of that stuff, all of that good stuff, along with all of the bad stuff, of course. I had to move it all to the, to the debit side of the ledger. Indeed, he says in verse 8, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Well, what do you put on the plus side if you move all your good stuff to the debit side? You put the righteousness of Christ, right? That's the gospel. I give up all that I am and have and hold dear and think is good and I, I condemn it all because God has condemned it all. But on the plus side, I put the righteousness of Christ. And now... I have salvation. It's the only way. Otherwise, I'm saying to God, you didn't need to send Christ. You didn't need to die. You didn't need to let the, the, the tower fall on your son. You wasted your time. Sorry. I don't need it. Paul got it. And when he got it, he became acceptable to God. But not because of what he did, but because of what Christ did. And so Jesus says, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. By the way, those of you who are interested in the grammar and that, those phrases back in Luke 13, the word, if you repent, it's a present tense word. Now we tell people, you accept Christ as your Savior and He comes into your life and He forgives you. And that's true. That's a biblical truth. But what Jesus is emphasizing here is something a little different. What Jesus is emphasizing here is if you do that and you have that one-time repentance that leads you to salvation, you will also be following up with a lifetime of repentance. Repentance will become your lifestyle. It won't just be a one-time thing. Does the one-time thing save you? Yes, but if it's not followed up with a continuous life of repentance, then it just says the first one wasn't real either. Are you with me? He's not saying you got to keep repentance, repenting to get saved, but he's saying you got to keep repenting because that shows that it was real. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Repentance, beloved, is at the heart of the gospel. Jesus' death and resurrection is only good news to those 
who repent. That's always been the message. Repentance has always been the message. Noah didn't stand on the steps of the ark and say, you know, something good is about to happen. That was not the message. Amos wasn't condemned by the priest in his day because he preached name it and claim it. Jeremiah didn't find himself thrown into a pit because he was saying, I'm okay, you're okay. Daniel wasn't thrown into the lion's den because he told people possibility thinking will move mountains. John the Baptist was not forced to preach in the wilderness and eventually lose his head because he said, smile, God loves you. And the two prophets in the, in the book of Revelation that are still to come to earth in the end time will not be killed as the Bible predicts they will be because they say God is in his heaven and all is right with the world. That is not, none of those are the gospel message. What is the gospel message? Repent and accept the gift of eternal life from God. Those men were all preaching the same message. Listen, the message of repentance. Somebody asked me one time, how come you're always talking about repentance? Because you can't preach the Bible without talking about it. It's everywhere in the Bible. It's, there are different words that are used. In the Old Testament, you'll often see, you read the prophets, you'll often see, come to me, return to me, turn to me. It's all another word for repentance. Come to me, hear me, listen to me. Return to me, repent or you will likewise perish. It's the message of the Bible. It was only when Paul repented of his perceived goodness that he found peace with God. Until that happens, we are living on borrowed time and the tower of God's judgment could fall at any time. Listen, borrowed time ends with physical death, right? The Bible says... It's an appointed unto man wants to die, and after that comes judgment. There are no tomorrows after that. You must be ready. God used this human tragedy to teach us this over and over. It reminds us of what Jim Elliott, remember the missionary to Ecuador who was killed by the Indians there for his faith, martyred? He said this one time. He said, when it comes time to die, make sure that all you have to do is die. And by that he meant you got to be ready because there's no opportunity after that. It's too late. You're living on borrowed time. How do I be ready? Don't wait until tomorrow. For the clock may then be still. We don't know, right? Be ready. Father, we thank you for this word. Lord, um, I, I, I'm convinced there are some here this morning who, who really haven't repented. They didn't really understand what it meant or they thought that just a simple prayer or coming down the aisle or turning in a card or something was, that would do it. Of course, it's never been about that. It's always been about a change in lifestyle that reflects, yes, a one-time decision, but a one-time decision that leads to a whole change in life. And so we have misled people and we have not been clear. So Lord, anyone who's here like that this morning, I'm just, I beg you, I plead with you. Turn their heart toward you. Lord, help them to be willing to give up whatever it is that stands between them and you, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing or whatever. Cause them to say right now, I, I, I repent of my sins, Lord. I, I, I give it to you. I turn away from it. I give it to you. For those, Lord, which I trust is the majority of our audience who really do know you, they've come to faith in you. I, I pray that this will reinforce in their minds the truth of the gospel. I pray that it will reinforce in their minds the need for continuous repentance in order to in order to make the family relationship with you be what it should be. I pray that you will also, Lord, renew in our minds the tenuous nature of our friends and relatives and neighbors who do not know you, who are living on borrowed time and they're not prepared. Give us compassion, Lord. We admit our hearts are sometimes stone cold when it comes to thinking of others. We're happy 
that we've got it, but we just, just, just somehow lack the compassion that's at the heart of, Lord, it's the reason Jesus would speak as he did. It wasn't because he wanted to be harsh. It was because he loved those people and he wanted them to come to you. Help us to be no less compassionate. So press the message that you have in our hearts to us. We pray as we, as we come to the end of this service. In Jesus' name, amen.